Homo sapiens line descends from a line that goes back about six million years, not much further than that, if we accept conventional evolutionary theory. So six million years ago, Antarctica is supposed to have been as cold and as frozen as it is today. And there's, no, there's undoubtedly a time, they found fossils on Antarctica, there's undoubtedly a time when, when Antarctica was, was lush and green. The question is, was it lush and green during the lifetime of the human species? Yes. Graham Hancock's theories about an ancient civilization in Antarctica are quite intriguing, although they veer significantly from mainstream scientific views. He speculates that a part of this lost advanced civilization was located in what's now the icy expanse of Antarctica. This is a striking thought considering Antarctica's current freezing conditions. He links this to the hypothesis of Earth crust displacement. The entire outer crust of the Earth, like the skin of an orange, might shift leaving the core of the Earth in place. This theory suggests that Antarctica wasn't always at the South Pole, but might have been in a more temperate region, allowing a civilization to thrive. However, it's crucial to note that this idea of Earth crust displacement isn't supported by the current scientific understanding of plate tectonics, which doesn't allow for such rapid and dramatic shifts of the Earth's crust. Hancock also delves into mythology, drawing connections between various global myths, legends, and religious texts. He interprets these as allegorical references to this lost civilization, particularly focusing on stories of great floods or cataclysms. He proposes that such a cataclysm, maybe a flood or a comet impact, led to the downfall of this advanced civilization. To me, the obvious answer is we are dealing with the fingerprints of a lost civilization that mapped the world and that left evidence of that mapping. According to his theory, survivors of this catastrophe might have traveled the world, spreading their advanced knowledge, significantly influencing the development of later civilizations like the Egyptians and Sumerians. One of the more fascinating aspects of his theory is how he points out the similarities in architectural structures and astronomical alignments at various ancient sites. He sees these as potential evidence of a shared origin of knowledge, suggesting that this knowledge could have been passed down from the earlier civilization. Hancock believes that this civilization's legacy includes not just advanced architectural techniques and astronomical observations, but potentially other lost technologies and wisdom. The date that Gobekli Tepe in Turkey is built, 11,600 years ago. <laughs> that, weirdly, is the date that Plato's Timaeus and Critias gives for the submergence of Atlantis. While his ideas certainly capture the imagination, it's important to remember that they are viewed with skepticism by the scientific community. Antarctica during the Eocene epoch was a completely different world from what we know today. It was actually positioned over the South Pole, just like it is now. But the climate back then was way warmer, allowing for a whole different kind of environment. This was a time when the continents were still shifting around after the breakup of the supercontinent Pangaea. So Antarctica, which was part of what we call Gondwana, was slowly moving to where it sits now, all isolated at the bottom of the world. This shifting around of continents, like Australia and South America moving away, played a big role in changing ocean currents and the climate. One of the most striking things about Antarctica back then was that it didn't have the massive ice sheet it has today. This absence of ice was mainly because of the much warmer global temperatures at the time. This had a big knock-on effect on the planet's climate, as the reflective ice that sends solar radiation back into space wasn't there, adding to the overall warmth. The tectonic movements during the Eocene were also pretty significant. The breakup of Gondwana was a major event reshaping the layout of the Earth's land and water. A key moment was the opening of the Drake Passage, the stretch of water between Antarctica and South America. This opening was a game-changer because it led to the creation of the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, which is a massive ocean current that goes around Antarctica. This current had a huge impact on the climate. It kind of put Antarctica in a climatic bubble, circulating cold water around it and stopping the warmer waters from the north from getting through. This is believed to have played a big part in cooling down Antarctica and leading to the ice-covered continent we know today. As for what life was like back then, the fossil records are really fascinating. They show that Antarctica supported a diverse range of plants and even animals. We're talking about temperate to subtropical forests with beaches, conifers and ferns. Imagine that in place of today's icy desert. These fossils tell us the climate was much warmer and humid. And then there's the sea level. 
which was way higher than what we see now because there weren't those big ice caps locking up all that water. So this is how, how do you know that sea level rose? There are certain corals that can only exist within a certain number of feet of the, of the sea's surface. This meant that the coastline and the shape of the land were quite different, and some places that are land now were underwater back then. The warmer temperatures and higher sea levels would have made the marine life around Antarctica rich and diverse, very different from what's there now. The Eocene epoch, which lasted from about 56 to 34 million years ago, was a really interesting time in Earth's history. It was part of this bigger period called the Paleogene period, and it's a part of what scientists call the Cenozoic era. This era is often nicknamed the Age of Mammals because it's when mammals started to diversify a lot especially after the dinosaurs had their big exit at the end of the Cretaceous period. During the Eocene, the world's continents were on the move, drifting towards where they are now. This movement was a big deal because it changed how ocean currents flowed and affected the climate in a bunch of ways. Now, one of the most dramatic things about the Eocene was this event called the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum. This happened around 56 million years ago, and it was a time when the Earth got really warm, really fast. Temperatures shot up by 5 to 8 degrees Celsius in just a few thousand years. Scientists think this might have been because of a ton of methane being released from the ocean floor. This warming had a huge impact on life on Earth. In the oceans, some species went extinct, while on land mammals started to evolve and diversify like crazy. The levels of CO2 in the atmosphere were also way higher than what we have today. Estimates say it was between 1,000 to 2,000 parts per million, which is a lot compared to the pre-industrial level of about 280 ppm. This high level of CO2 came from things like volcanic activity, burning of organic matter, and because natural carbon sinks weren't as effective, one of the big differences between the Eocene and now was that there were no major ice sheets at the poles. This is really different from today, where we've got big ice caps in both the Arctic and Antarctic. Because the Earth was so much warmer, the temperature difference between the equator and the poles wasn't as extreme as it is now. As a result, the polar regions were much warmer than they are today. And because there was less ice, sea levels were higher. This means a lot of water that's currently frozen in ice was in the ocean back then. This affected marine life a lot, changing where different species lived and leading to the development of new types of marine ecosystems. One of the things I find most striking is the presence of Antarctica on ancient maps, because we didn't discover it until 1820. Now, Graham has a really fascinating theory about an ancient advanced civilization that he believes existed long before the civilizations we commonly recognize, like the Sumerians of Mesopotamia. His idea pushes the timeline of advanced human societies back tens of thousands of years, possibly even to the last ice age, this is a huge leap from the established historical understanding, which generally sees complex societies and civilizations emerging more recently. Hancock points to the incredible architectural feats of ancient megalithic structures, like those at Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, Stonehenge in England, and various sites in Egypt and Mesoamerica. He sees these as evidence of a highly advanced architectural knowledge. Moreover, he talks about the astronomical precision of these structures, for instance, how the Great Pyramids of Giza align with the stars of Orion's belt, or how Stonehenge aligns with the solstices and equinoxes. These aren't just random placements, they suggest a deep understanding of the stars and seasons. He also believes this civilization had impressive navigational skills, which might explain how similar architectural and astronomical concepts appeared across different continents. But it's not just about the buildings and their alignments with celestial events. Hancock thinks these ancient monuments reflect a comprehensive knowledge of astronomy that was integrated into the culture and religious practices of the time. He also suggests evidence of sophisticated urban planning in ancient ruins, indicating a level of societal organization and city-building knowledge that's not typically credited to prehistoric societies. Then there's the idea of a global spread of knowledge. Hancock theorizes that the similarities in architectural styles and astronomical knowledge across various ancient cultures around the world point to a common, advanced source of knowledge. This knowledge could have been spread by the survivors of this ancient society. Graham Hancock's theory really takes a global perspective when it comes to the influence of this ancient, advanced civilization he proposes. He thinks that this civilization had a major impact all over the world, it's not just a localized phenomenon, but something that reached across continents, 
According to him, we can see traces of this civilization in the myths, architectural designs, and astronomical knowledge of many different ancient cultures. He's suggesting that there's a kind of cultural diffusion that took place from this lost civilization to later societies. So when we see similar styles in buildings or common themes in religious beliefs and astronomical practices across various ancient cultures, he interprets this as evidence of their influence. He goes further to speculate that after some huge disaster that brought this civilization down, the survivors might have spread out to different areas of the world. These survivors, he believes, were the ones who passed on their advanced knowledge and this played a crucial role in the development of the civilizations we know about from history, like the Egyptians and Sumerians. Now, when it comes to evidence, Hancock looks at archaeological sites and findings that he feels mainstream archaeology hasn't been able to fully explain. He talks about structures that, to him, seem like they needed pretty advanced engineering or astronomical know-how to build. He also dives into ancient texts and myths, interpreting them not just as stories or legends, but as allegorical records of real historical events. Think of tales about great floods or lost lands like Atlantis. Hancock sees these as collective memories of the lost civilization. He also notes that there are these cross-cultural similarities, like how myths from different parts of the world seem to share common themes, or how architectural styles and astronomical knowledge seem to echo each other even across cultures that supposedly never interacted. To Hancock, this points to a shared, older source of knowledge.